Hey guys, and uh, welcome to another episode of First Rule. Um, just myself and Richard tonight. Um, you know, the VPA might join us for the next show um, that we have on, but we're going to cover this uh, topic the best we can. I think we've, we've both done a little bit of research here, you know, and can add quite a bit of content around this topic. Um, and tonight we want to talk about advertising, promotion, and sponsorship. So, you know, if you look at the bill and you look at page 11, I think it's page, is it page 10? No, page 11. Um, in the middle of the page, that's where this starts. And, you know, it's, it's quite a big section. So I'm going to take you guys through it, myself and Richard, and we'll talk about each of the points that they make and, you know, potentially what impact they could have, um, you know, should that portion of the bill be passed. All right. So let's start out uh, with how it starts. Advertising, promotion, sponsorship, display, tobacco products, and electronic delivery system. So that's on page 11. And then it starts by saying, in the section, relevant product includes devices used in connection with tobacco products and electronic delivery systems, such as pipes, water pipes, and electronic devices and components of those products or systems. No person shall advertise or promote or cause any other person to advertise or promote a relevant product or be in the course of that person's business. You know, party to an agreement for or related to a sponsorship in respect of a, a relevant product. Okay. So that's quite a, quite a bit there that they're saying is in the front, right, Richard? Yeah, that's the uh, the key to this whole thing is no person shall advertise or promote. Mm. Now, the advertising, fine, that is okay. Cigarette advertising is banned. We accept that. You know, they probably don't want vaping brands to be to be advertised. The big problem is with the word promote. <laughs> now, if we look further. Uh, they they unpack that a little bit. And they say that advertising, promotion, and sponsorship of a relevant product includes product placement in broadcast television, film, video recording, telecast, game, or other communication for which the producer or any other person associated mm -hmm. with it with the channel receives payment or other consideration. Okay, now we need to now unpack is getting stuff for free and other consideration mm. yeah because that's vague you know um and and, and it's, it goes quite wide here i mean um it says here broadcast program right um uh, broadcast program film video recording telecast game or other communication you know what i mean so mm -hmm. that part is also quite vague. So is other communication like online communication, you know, for instance, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure how far they go. I guess it is a broadcast program. So for instance, this show is, is something that we broadcast on YouTube, but you know, um, where we broadcasting it to where the servers are sitting is, is not in South Africa. So does that make, you know, say if I promote a product, on YouTube, does it make, you know, um, am I in the wrong there? Shall this bill pass? I'm not quite sure. Um, but anyway. Yeah, it seems very clumsy. Um, they've made it as wide as they possibly can. And, you know, that, that other consideration needs unpacking. You know, if it means you can't do a YouTube review of a juice or a device or whatever, uh, because that falls under other consideration, then, uh, you know, obviously they're going all out yeah. on it. <laughs> it's uh, paragraph five, section A. A retailer or wholesaler who sells the relevant product may not display that product at his or her place of business, mm. but may make the product available to consumers upon request if the request is over the age of 18 years. So that means you can't even have a shelf of juices behind the counter. You've got to keep everything out of sight. Yeah. Somebody's, 
Somebody's got to come in and ask and say, I want ABC type of juice, and then you fetch it for them, which this to me goes heavily into overreach. Now, I mean, I can understand the vaping advertising ban because if people tune in to the eight o'clock news or to Baywatch or whatever on, on TV, if you've got adverts for vaping products there, a whole lot of non-smokers and non-vapers are going to see those and they're going to be induced into, into trying this. But nobody who's a non-smoker or a non-vapor or who has no interest in the product goes into a retail, goes into a vaping re retail shop. I can sort of understand this applying at spa or pick and pay, you know, or supermarkets that, stores, yeah. yeah, you know, that, that attract the general public. Then, okay, maybe put the cigarettes and the vaping devices under the counter and people have to ask them for them specifically. That is happening uh, no. in Europe in, increasingly at, at the moment, yeah. yeah. Uh, they're making it a case that if, if you want tobacco products, you, you have to actually go in and ask for them. You can't see them on, the, on display. But to do it in a vaping shop, is, is just crazy. And, th and that is where I think the law needs to split and say this only applies to, you know, general dealers, supermarkets, convenience stores. It doesn't apply to... The specialist stores, yeah. Yeah, specialist outlets like, yeah. like, like vaping shops. I mean, to go into shop and not be able to see a mod on the shelf because now it's inducing you to vape. I'm a vapor already if I'm in the shop. Yeah. Or at least I've, I've expressed the interest that I want to vape. So, you know, that, that makes absolutely no, no sense to me. That, that's overreach in a big way. And what they've done is they've just taken, they've taken the tobacco regulation, which again is fair enough, take the cigarettes off the shelf behind the, mm. the till, put them under the counter so that people can't see them, and then you ask for them. That's fair enough. Mm. You know, you go into, you go into, you know an eight-year-old kid goes into spa to buy a bar one, he doesn't want to see packs, rows and rows of, of cigarettes, you know, behind the counter. So that's yeah. fair enough. But then word it that way, you know, don't, mm. don't extend it to this broad umbrella legislation that makes things completely ridiculous from a, from a specialist uh, outlet point of view. Can you imagine going to a vaping shop in the future? It would be like, it would be like coming to my spare room where I am right now. You know what I mean? Hi, sir. How can I help you? <laughs> well, it's it's like? crazy. You know, sh shops just with white shelves up and you have to know exactly what you want when you go in. Nothing can be displayed. It's, it's absolutely crazy. But I, I see they, they're, even going now, they're even going to a business-to-business -business level. The provisional of financial or support, whether or not in exchange for publicity by a manufacturer, importer, distributor, or supplier, to, uh, burp, 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 burp. no, again, any sorry, event, I'm... activity, individual, or group, no. including, yeah, yeah, that's... no, that, that, that's fine. Political yeah. candidates, politicians, welfare organizations, that's all fine. But they, they've even extended it now to the retail trade. Oh, uh, a retailer or a wholesaler who sells a relevant product may not display the product at his or her place of business, but may, but make the product available to consumers upon request if the request is of the age of 18 years. Is that what you're looking But then for? further, no, no, further from that, the offer of a financial or other incentive or reward to a retailer in order to encourage or induce that retailer to sell the relevant product. Mm. So in other words, you can't go to spa now and say, you know, we'll, we'll give you a bulk discount or whatever if you sell our juice or our mod or, or whatever. I, I mean, they're starting to interfere with the fundamental mechanisms of, of a free market <laughs> economy. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. No, but I mean, you know, and, and of course, it's because of the nicotine that vaping is demonized, you know, hmm. and, you know, the whole thing around this is um, trying to not normalize smoking again through vaping, yes. you know, yeah. so um, people, unfortunately, the public sees these two things as similar, you know, so I, I get that, but, you know, uh, for them to just uh, to go this extreme is just absurd because um, 
you know, if you, if you take this bill and, you know, the advertising portion of this and you ap apply it strictly, um, I'm not sure how the vaping community will last, especially, you know, um, cause, because what, what you would have to do is you need to try to keep uh, the customers that you already know of, right? Um, but anybody new uh, that wants to start vaping will have almost zero information unless they go and ask somebody who they see is vaping, you know, um, or they know of a vape store, they can go in there, but they won't see any information about where to get the products specifically, not on email. They won't be able to see it online. Um, they'll have to go and look for it, you know? And uh, so it just, it makes it more difficult for a person to switch over even if they are a smoker. So yeah, um, it's, it's, it is, uh, I think what, uh, Fidel was talking about now is becoming very clear to me here that, you know, it almost feels like, you know, when you, um, you're negotiating a deal and, you know, you bargaining on a number, but you purposefully go beyond that number because, you know, uh, you want to settle on your number. So you purposefully go in way higher. So it almost feels like this bill is doing that. It feels like it's reaching really high. And, you know, it knows that the public will respond and there will be backlash and then it, it will come to an agreement. And that, that agreement that they'll get is probably where they want to be, you know? It, it is, but it, it sends disturbing signals when they're willing to overreach to that extent. You know, I mean, it, as a government, they must surely be aware of you know, the, the mechanics of a, of a free market uh, economy. You can't start interfering with communications between wholesalers and retailers, mm. asking people who are retailing a legal product to not even display that legal product in, in their shop. You, you can kind of understand the advertising ban. You can understand the, the sponsorship ban. I mean, mm. we don't want the smock V8 Proteas for example, mm. but to then extend that further that you, you can't walk into a shop and see a smock package mm. on the counter. You can't see a poster mm. uh, of, of the new Vandy vape product atomizer. Yeah. You can't see, you know, a, a display of some manufacturer's new juices. It's just going way beyond, you know, even I understand they, you know they're upping the ante so that mm. they can they can give something back and still end up with with where they wanted. Yeah. But they they're going into an area now where uh, you know it's the worst of big government. Mm. Yeah, I mean you know um, I'm not sure if you've realised or if you've seen this, but in many malls um, uh, there's tobacco shops in in the mall. Um, and some of these shops now uh, are selling vaping juice as well um, and vape gear as well. Um, but if you go to their stores, you, you at this point in time, you can't see anything from the outside. You know what I mean? You can't see, um, you know, some of the stores that I've seen, you can't really see some of the products. You have to go into the store and then you see, okay, here's all the products here. But it's, I mean, it's, it's almost physically impossible to not have any product show if you're a retail shop. How does that work? I mean, um, how would you, how would you do that? <laughs> Unless you've got a massive storeroom at the back. <laughs> well, it's, it's it's like the Mozambique look, you know. You just have empty empty shelves up. I mean, a, a friend of mine used to go. To, yeah, a friend of mine used to, used to go to Mozambique during during the worst times there of the uh, of the lack of of stuff. Mm. And he went to the supermarket, and there were just empty shelves. <laughs> he said, "What have you got for sale?" And I said, "Well, help yourself. <laughs> There's nothing on the shelves, but." We're here to help you, if you should you ever need it. <laughs> and then that's what it seems they're looking at. Just, you know, the Apple iPod looked just white plastic <laughs> everywhere <laughs> with, with no real defining feature. And you have to actually ask for, for what it is that you 
that you want, which it sounds like a, you're doing a, you know, you're doing some kind of crime, you know, like you would go up to the guy behind the counter and you would ask him specifically what you want, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. absurd. It, again, Again, I get that. I get that in a supermarket. I, I don't have any problems with that. If I go into spa and I want my twenty camel or whatever, go up to the cigarette counter where you can't see the stuff, and you just say to the guy, "Twenty camel, please," because that's what you've been smoking for thirty years, and you know you don't need new brand information because you know how often do they bring out new cigarette brands? It's once every two years, three years or so. Um, so in that case, I can understand it. Smokers have their preferred brands, they have their established shopping routine, the shops that they go into. Asking for it is no problem. Not not being able to see it on display is, is not a problem. But if you're a new vapor going into a shop, you can't see devices, you can't see juices. <laughs> it's like, where am I? Am I no, it's the like, right place? <laughs> you know, what do I even ask for? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, what does this last section mean to you? Um, it says here, this section must not be construed as limiting, amending, repealing, or otherwise altering any legal obligation or liability in terms of any other law to warn consumers of risk of using relevant product, which is a, which a manufacturer, importer, or retailer is required to comply with. Well, no, what that means is that you're, even if your products aren't on view, they still have to carry the nicotine as an addictive substance. You know, yeah. all, all, the, all those other disclaimers on it. All, all your brand packaging still needs to, to be within the, uh, mm. within the law. You can't say, well, I didn't have to put the, the health warning on the packs because they're not on display to, to oh, consumers. Okay, yeah, uh, got you. You still need, yeah, you still need to put those, those warnings on. <laughs> the, no, the no vending machines, I can understand. I mean, yes. you use vending machines anyway. Anyway, uh, yeah. These days. Plus, you know, with vape gear, you know, what are you, what are you going to do? You're going to get like a, a smock V12 out of a vending machine. No, it falls I don't think so. Yeah. So, so that I can agree with. And, and again, you know, you don't want a vending machine, you know, placed at a school or, or or something like that. So that makes sense. Nobody buys from vending machines anyway. I mean, mm. where they, they maybe got them at airports and that, that, that's about it. So that, that's fine. Um, let's have a look at some, at some of these other th things here. Uh, oh, this br brand stretching and brand um, association is, is quite an interesting one. Yeah, yeah. I actually took that portion out but talk about it. Yeah. Um, th this basically, again, comes back to Big Tobacco and their, their sponsorship of Formula One teams and, and so on, where they, they're trying to create an association. You know, in the old days, you had the Lotus team that was rebranded to, to John Player Special and the, the black and gold John Player Special color scheme and, and, and so on. And that creates a definite uh, brand association in the, in the mind of the of the consumer. I mean, I know people who started smoking John Player Special specifically because they were Formula One fans and that was the Formula One <coughs> champion team at, at the time. The cars looked gorgeous. I mean, there was really cool black and gold um, color scheme and so on. And they used to sell toys mm. of them. You know, Formula One uh, die cast uh, metal toys with with the JPS color scheme on and the logo and, and everything and that again I agree we don't really really want that you know there was too much of that big tobacco getting into people's heads with sports sponsorships and and, and whatnot and then the interesting idea is brand sharing which comes up to it boils down to much the same thing you, you don't want to create an association in the mind of the consumer between the tobacco product and the associated sport or activity or service or product. But I think what they're getting at specifically here is that they don't want uh, Philip Morris to call the IQOS the Marlboro IQOS. Mm. They, don't, they don't want any brand sharing between cigarette brands and vaping brands because yeah. then that, you know, again, it's using vaping to market smoking, to market uh, smoking it's using smoking to market vaping it's kind of cross-pollination which the cigarette companies are obviously going to do the vaping companies wouldn't but i mean they've got no reason to to punt uh, cigarette brands 
but the big tobacco companies certainly would be would be very keen on that, trying to create an association, trying to carry that brand loyalty of Marlboro or Camel or, or whatever over into into vaping. So that that's quite interesting that they um, they haven't allowed that. But I think that is more a big tobacco thing Probably, than yeah. a than a vaping thing. Um, yeah. I'm interested to see how this thing about not having any. Uh, paid uh, presence in movies mm. um, because it does still leave the door open for an unpaid presence in movies and we are seeing this in Hollywood with you know scenes now where people are vaping and so on but as, as long as it's not actually paid by the company it's it's not a problem mm. how are they going to prove it wasn't paid by the company is another matter I mean if I go to a Hollywood producer and I offer him a dirty, dirty weekend in Las Vegas with <laughs> cocaine parties if he, if he puts, puts my mod in his movie how are they ever going to prove that I didn't offer an, an inducement yeah exactly so you know that's that's a, a loophole there mm. uh, but a, a lot of the stuff as as well you know how are they ever even going to to enforce this kind of thing no I mean there's no way so um <sighs> you know, maybe they put, made this as strict as they possibly could to see, just to see what the, you know, the public will say about this. Um, you know, but if I was a retailer, I, I would specifically talk about this because, you know, um, what you are pretty much telling me here is that I can't sell my product. You know what I mean? Because, um, or, or you actually, you, you're gonna, um, allow me to, you know, to not actively sell my product in the way I, I best can, right? So, um, you know, you, you're affecting businesses here w with that. Um, and this, the vaping industry is not that big, you know, so um, I can see a big tobacco company, a big tobacco, you know, uh, being so big that they, you know, they know how to navigate or they can navigate this better, uh, this kind of, of regulations better than what vaping could, you know, because vaping is not that big yet. The problem I'm seeing here as well is that I, I don't agree with the vaping industry's claims that <clears throat> vaping should fall under a different act. I mean, the, the aim of government is to have as few acts as possible. Vaping and, and smoking both produce nicotine. It makes sense for me to do, for them to be regulated under the same act, but with different clauses and different chapters. Yeah, the, distinguish this in, yeah, this entire thing for me is is, is big tobacco, but mm. what they haven't factored in is that the big tobacco retail model is completely different from the vaping retail model. Yeah. Vaping is online and via specialist shops. Big tobacco is all convenience stores, supermarkets, there are very, very few specialist tobacco outlets. There's still one or two tobacconists, but yeah. really very, very few. Uh, I'd say 99% of cigarette sales come via supermarkets, filling station, convenience stores, and, and liquor stores. Yeah. Now there, obviously, you do have problems because there, there are other uh, products that are being sold in these places. Non-smokers are coming in. You don't want cigarettes to have high visibility in these places because, That's particularly in the case... Super public, yeah. Yeah, particularly in the case of supermarkets, there's a lot of kids coming in uh, as well. So you want cigarettes to not be visible and to have, uh, you know, not have a prominent presence there. In a vape shop, that doesn't apply. Under 18 shouldn't even be allowed in vape shops. Yeah, I, I also you know, think that's probably what they need to do is to, you know, just say, put an ad, uh, age ban on it and say, you know, you shouldn't even be, um, asking somebody for cigarettes if you're not over 18, you know, you shouldn't go into a vape shop if you're not over 18. Exactly. It's, it's a bar. You yeah. put a notice at the door saying no under 18 is allowed. Yeah. Finished and start. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, so yeah, I think they need to distinguish in this specific portion of the bill um, between uh, what is, uh, see, that's why I think, um, 
uh, a lot of people want to cover it in two different acts here because uh you know if if you just look at it as in a single act um then it's so difficult to distinguish between the two you know what i'm saying but it's possible <laughs> You make a separate chapter. Mm. No, no, it's not a separate chapter, but you just make a, you know, for each point, this is point three, advertising, promotion, sponsorship is, is point three. Mm. So you make a point three A, which is uh, uh, cigarettes, mm. cigarettes, cigars, cigarillas. You make a, a point three B, which is vapor Vaping. products. Yeah. Mm. And you do it in such a way that the tobacco companies can't now start you know, using vape shop loopholes. Yeah, because, you know... To get um, around. Because, you know, in their mind, I'm just trying to, to throw a span in the works here, but in their mind, imagine if that had to go, then cigarettes are not visible, right? But you've got these bottles of, of liquid standing around there, um, and it's visible. So I think the problem then will be, be between smoking and vaping. You know, why, why is the one allowed but the other isn't, you know? So, I mean, it's so difficult to keep everybody happy here. Um, yeah. Well, you, you've got the, the situation that if I'm a vape shop owner, I'm allowed to display my products, uh, you know, openly to the public and, and so on. What, what do I do when RJ Reynolds or Philip Morris come to me and say, hey, bud, do you, do you want to stock uh, Marlboro cigarettes for us, Camel cigarettes for us? Mm. Um, you know, We'll we'll pay you a hundred thousand rand if you achieve X amount of sales. Mm. Uh, we want prominent position in your shop. We want mm. posters put up in the windows. Uh, we want you to recommend the product to everybody that comes in. Let's try and turn these vapors back to smoking now. You know, if if I'm struggling to make ends meet, that that becomes a very attractive offer. Yeah. For me, and if there are different clauses that are that pertain. To, to vape shops, then I can use a loophole. But this is where you make it about the product, not about the outlet. Yeah. You just, you just say cigarettes may not be displayed anywhere, not in convenience stores, not in supermarkets, not in vape shops, mm. not in bottle stores. Vapor products can be displayed in vape shops, but nowhere else. If they're stored at spa, then it's the same as cigarettes. They go under the counter, and if you want to get your you know, cannoli juice, you go in and you ask no, for it. But I, I, I don't think um, that, you know, whoever put this bill together um, has any clue that there's, you know, a difference in the market between where cigarettes are being sold and where vaping products are being sold. So, you know, do you think by just, um, you know, just uh, making them aware of, how different the two markets is and what the impact here would be by putting it, you know, just under a one umbrella, this bull uh, or the specific part of it would mean for the one industry. Do you think that would make a difference? I think it, it was written in haste. I mean, we heard nothing about vaping regulation for years and years and years. And then suddenly once, once they held the, um, the WHO anti-tobacco conference here, and suddenly there was pressure on the ministry you know, you guys are now lagging behind the rest of the world in terms of, of clamping down on tobacco products. What are you going to do about it? And then suddenly this uh, draft bill came out. And I think it was a case of they just, under global pressure and under, under the pressure of being seen to do something, they had to do something really quickly. So they basically just tacked uh, vaping legislation onto existing tobacco legislation, legislation. and decided yeah, yeah. decide tobacco legislation, lump the two together and and presented them to the public as is. And this is where I think obviously organizations like VPA so, and the other vaping stakeholders can serve to put pressure on, on government um, mm. to delineate this a little bit and to have separate sections that relate specifically to vapor products. Mm. Uh, because it, the industry has such a different business model from big tobacco that to try and get one umbrella legislation that covers both is going to be very unwise and it's going to be very unenforceable mm. as well. 
I mean, there, for example, there are no cigarette forums that I know of. There are no cigarette YouTube channels. I mean, who, who reviews cigarettes on YouTube? The same <laughs> brands have been, have been out for years. I mean, everybody knows what their brand is. You don't, you don't need cigarette reviews on, on YouTube. Vaping is almost all word of mouth. Big tobacco is almost all... Um, uh, advertising. No, it's yeah. not advertising because they, they can't do that. But it, it's, mm. it's on the established presence of, of the brand. Yes. I mean, I, sm I smoked Chesterfield when I smoked, not because I saw adverts, but because I tried several different brands. Chesterfield was the one. So I smoked that for like 20 years. Mm. So th there's, there's no brand change in, in that time. I just go in once or twice a week to the spa and I buy my packs of Chesterfield. And that, that's how I lived for years and years and years. It's not a fast moving market like vaping where today's hot modern tank is, is completely archaic in mm. six months or eight months down the line. And consumers need to be updated about the product. And this yeah. is where things like, like YouTube um, reviews and forums and tutorials and, you know, just the whole social media thing around vaping is, is vital. Um, and I think vaping should be quite happy with the advertising ban because let's face it, vaping also doesn't have the sort of money to go in for large scale advertising. I mean, which juice manufacturer in South Africa can afford to buy an ad on SABC or even MNET for that matter, even ETV? Mm. They're, just, they're not working with that kind of budget. I mean, these guys are designing their labels themselves in Photoshop. They're not, they're not hiring PR companies. They're not hiring marketing companies. So they, they don't have the sort of money where they can go to great advertising and pop down a quarter of a million rand, mm. you know, make us a 15 second advert. They can't pay for the airtime either. So it's, it suits the industry business model to have a social media word of mouth type of marketing, WhatsApp groups, Facebook groups, YouTube channels, whatever. Mm. That, that works really well. And it's not advertising in the strictest sense of the, world, of the word. People aren't being paid for it. Facebook's not getting any money because, you know, some vaping company wants, wants to advertise its products there. They're, they're not paying money to, to Facebook to advertise there. So I think the legislation needs to draw that, that line very clearly. Um, and it needs to give vaping a chance to get itself as established as, as smoking is. Smoking doesn't need any advertising. It doesn't. You know, uh, I mean, same here. I was smoking uh, Peter Stuyvesant for 15 years. And the only reason I smoked Peter Stuyvesant is because I had tried most of the cigarettes I could get my hand on. And, you know, the Virginia tobacco, um, the, you know, and then later on I moved to Winston Blue was also Virginia the tobacco. And that's obviously where my taste was, right? Um, nobody had given me any information uh, about it. I had to figure it out by myself. Um, and then when I saw somebody vaping, um, you know, and I have been trying to quit or just get off cigarettes because I, after 15 years, I started feeling it in my chest. Um, I, I realized that, you know, I'm, I'm on a bit of a downward spiral. Um, and it's, and it's, it's not, you know, it's not going to be long before, you know, the first signs of emphysema or whatever is going to come along. So, um, desperately looking for something, then saw somebody vaping and then decided to make the switch after, you know, quite a bit of, of reading that I had done. But, you know, through that, when I was reading, I just found a wealth of information online about the products and what people were thinking. And, you know, that almost, you know, turned, and that is now turned into, to a hobby for me. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you. They have to allow, um, people who want to still make the switch from big tobacco because it is a harm reduction product, you know, and by cutting this with the same knife as what you're cutting uh, big tobacco right now, you could um, deny people the chance that want to switch over, you know, um, from smoking to, to vaping because you, you, you're making it, um, you're not making it visible, you know, that there is a, a harm reduction product on the market. We're not advertising it. We're just giving you information, which is correct. You know, um, that's not advertising, but, um, 
I guess I guess there has to be a, some kind of line drawn in the sand here because, you know, uh, it's we we you know us and smokers are you're not in a, it's so different you know we we breathe out emissions and to the public that is, it looks exactly the same as smoking, you know, so. Um, you know, to for for smoking, I mean, for big tobacco, they would be um, they wouldn't be too impressed if vaping got um, off off it, um, not cut with the same knife. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, I'm not sure how that would work, but I do think that this bill, um, this specific portion, need they need to elaborate on this. They need to enrich it a lot more so that it's, it's a lot clearer and get information back from the public on how to do this correctly. Because by doing this, this, bad, this here, I mean, there's so many things I could think about here on advertising, um, you know, that bothered me. One big thing for me is VapeCon. Um, I'm not sure how you would have a VapeCon if advertising and promotion is banned, you know, and sponsorship as well, because I think sponsorship also goes a lot of, you know, a lot of people um, and trade shows have some kind of sponsor or donation that goes towards, especially when they start out. Um, so I'm not sure what will happen to VapeCon if this had to pass, um, because, you know, the whole event is to promote vaping. You know, and as yeah. soon as you, as soon as you walk into the front doors, there's posters, there's people walking around with juice, giving you information about products. I mean, it's pretty much everything that I'm reading here is is what happens at at VapeCon, you know, or any vape uh, festival or uh, show for that, you know, for that matter. So, um, if this passes in in its current wording, if this passes then, you know, this year could be the last VapeCon that we go to. I'm not yeah. sure how you would navigate that. Well, I mean, look at this, for, for example, uh, paragraph four, subsection D. Any, any commercial uh, communication, act or practice that is intended or is likely to promote a manufacturer. Now, I mean, when you have... Vape girls giving out flyers at VapeCon, that is likely to promote a manufacturer, right? Mm. I mean, they say any commercial mm. communication, but I mean, those girls are paid to be there. Mm. They, they paid. There's, an, there's an agreement there, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the company paid to have the flyers made. So, I mean, it's, it's a commercial act. You're paying mm. people to, to distribute flyers on your behalf. Those flyers obviously are likely to promote the manufacturer. Um, and, uh, uh, what, yeah. Well, I mean, what is the, what is, what is the point of that? <laughs> yeah. You know, it completely, and again, we don't want it with tobacco. You don't want to go to the Rand show and there's a Marlboro girl handing out cartons of smokes there. Agreed. We don't want that with tobacco. Vaping, different story. When it's VapeCon, you know, if you don't vape, don't go to VapeCon. It's, just, it's as simple as that. You know, who who is going to go to VapeCon if they don't want to vape or if they don't want to find out about vaping? Yeah. So, you know, they have to also think about that industry, um, you know, if, and especially if I was, I was part of that or arranging that, um, this would be concerning for me. And I would want to make them aware that, you know, enforcing this kind of thing would mean that we can't have trade shows around this. And, you know, it's not like a device with, you know, a device on its own is going to do anybody harm. It's not, you know, if it's just standing there, it's not going to do anybody any harm. Um, it's the person who buys it, you know, that that's the person who makes the decision um, that that's what he wants. Right. I mean, that's my choice, you know, it's it's kind of like my choice um, that they they're taking away from me. Yeah. Anyway, um, and the thing is also that you know they could there could be loopholes. I mean, you've got things like gaming expos, which attract a lot of kids. You know, you've got a big expo out at at Midrand or or whatever, several exhibition halls full of of gaming devices and gear and so on. Again, you don't want 
vaping companies to go in there and to share space with, you know, ga at a gaming expo that's, that's aimed at kids. But then you word it that way. I mean, my, my sense with this act is, is that they, this specific area, there, there's quite a lot of, of the act that I, I don't have major problems with, but this specific area, I think they need to basically throw this out and go back and rethink and it. Really, yeah. Well, re, reword everything, you know, to lump two <laughs> industries with, with entirely different business models together under the same legislation, just, it doesn't make sense from a commercial point of view, it doesn't make sense from a legal point of view, it doesn't make sense from a, a pragmatic uh, point of, of view. They, what they've done is they've just taken the tobacco legislation and just tacked vaping on and said, thrown it at the people and said, here you go, that's, that's the rule. So, yeah. I think this is worth fighting um, at a at a deep level, uh, and this again, the industry will be best positioned to do this rather, rather than the the consumers. Although again, I think consumers could email Lynn uh, at the Department of Health and just outline your concerns about you know what this means to to people's to ease the transition from from smoking into vaping. Yeah, exactly. It makes it, it makes it really difficult. It makes it difficult. You know, um, was it Tembi or Fidel that spoke about that as well, that said, you know, um, by putting in the advertising uh, or this advertising or promoting and um, wording as strictly as they have, you are saying that we're not allowed to give out information that could save somebody's life. You know what I mean? So um, that, that to me, you know, we need to really be careful with what we do here because it can affect a lot of people's lives. So, you know, it's worth rethinking how you word this because, um, you know, it could, impact, so. yeah, it could impact a lot of businesses um, and a lot of people's lives. This is one area, much like the online, the ban of online sales, that definitely needs a split. Mm. With cigarettes the one side and and vaping the, the other side, it, yeah, it needs mm. to have very specific clauses for both, which is doable under one act. You know, the clauses for motorcycles are very different from the clauses for heavy duty trucks, and yet they're all covered by the road transport mm. act. So, I mean, you can do it in one act. You just need to be quite specific about the particular product that you're referring to with this um, specific clause. Yeah. So I would, uh, you know, I, I think this is worth opposing at a at a very high level, uh, and I think they would they would need to do a lot more work on this before getting, you know, a workable and enforceable bill. I mean, the bottom line that they should be striving for is to have a cascading, uh, a sort of layered thing where you make it the easiest and the cheapest to not use nicotine at all, and then you make it a little bit less easy and cheap to vape, and then you make it a lot less easy and cheap to smoke. Mm. So you, ca you cascade it down like that, where you, know, you put rewards and incentives in place for people to transition from the most harmful form of nicotine use to the least harmful, <clears throat> and then off it all, all together. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm um, not sure if you read the news. This is kind of off topic. But uh, Jewel has finally decided to release a pod that's only got 3% of nicotine salts in it, which equates, equals uh, 30 milligrams of nic <laughs> to help you transition <laughs> from 5% down to 3%. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, that for me is such a... It's such a minefield that, I mean, I'm on, I'm on two milligrams, Nick, at the moment. I would rather stick needles in my eyes than transition to 30 milligrams, Nick, because <laughs> then I'm back on the addiction train big time. Big time. You know, I, mean, I was talking in the, in the forum today about the fact that I, I can go out for dinner, I can go out for four or five hours to a restaurant, not vape, and not miss it. And that, that's taken work. Mm. It's taken hard work to wean myself from where I started, 18 milligram, down to 12, down to 6, down to 3, now down to 2. Mm. And it means I can go hours and hours without vaping, and it, and it doesn't 
and it doesn't bother me. Mm. And now they come out with 30 and 40 and 50 milligram neck, which is just, you know, it's just going to push me right back into it. So it's an act of extreme willpower to avoid this stuff. And Skittle said, Skittle said this. I mean, he was off cigarettes entirely. He was vaping happily on his three milligram juice or whatever. Pods come out with the neck salts. He goes on that and now he's back on the, on the cigarettes again. It just, nicotine mm. just sucks you back in mm. at the drop of a hat. And that, that's why it's taken me extreme willpower to not go that route. And it's something I don't really... I mean, I understand it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Yes, you want a satisfying nicotine hit for smokers mm. to transition off it. But, you know, the, you know, vapors who have become accustomed to three milligram and two milligram nick now see these 30 and 40 and 50 milligram devices coming out. There's going to be such a temptation to just try it. Fall, yeah, to fall right back into it. And I guarantee within a day of me vaping a jewel, I'd be back so heavily on on nicotine i i wouldn't be able to go out and eat, and eat at a restaurant without taking it with me and still vaping in the bathroom or stuff or yeah. and it's just it's not a place i want to be again yeah i, you know, um, I fought, yeah you were saying I, I fought hard to get off it i don't want to undo that work now yeah i'm i'm with you here i think that's one thing we really agree about um, when nicotine salts hit uh, the market, it's just um, you know I I don't I don't know why I wanted because the whole thing was why you know you can take more nicotine and the nicotine is smoother, you know, so you can actually put more nicotine in your juice without really realizing that it's there, and I didn't really understand why I would want to do that because I was going the opposite direction. You know, um, I recently had bronchitis and I couldn't even vape three milligram juice. It was, I could have one or two drags and I would just cough my lungs out. And um, I went down to 1% um, in one of the juices that I had mixed up, uh, mixed up and that seemed to work fine. I could have six or seven draws without feeling like I want to cough my lungs out um, you know, with bronchitis, of course. And now I've gotten used to it. Now I've been mixing lately with just one milligram of, of Nick in it, you know, and I'm quite happy with myself. Um, I don't, I, you know, there's been an, a serious temptation to um, buy nicotine salts and to get a, a pod system and try out this, you know, this revolution. But I'm I'm just so damn scared that you know I, I can't I can't go back because I've been reading stuff now online, um, where uh, some of the kids are saying that you know um, you could you could be dueling for two days and that would be enough, you know, that would be enough to get you on it, you know, and and that that scares the shit out of me, you know what I mean? That it's that easy. Look, the argument they give is that when you have higher nick, there's, there's less temptation uh, to do it because you have two drags and then your nick, you get your nick rush and you, you don't get the cravings. But that overlooks the fact that, for me anyway, it's as much about the mechanical routine as it is about mm. the actual nicotine intake. I, I like keeping my hands busy and, and vaping is a way to do that. So if, if I vape 50 milligram, it's not a case that I'm going to be taking one drag an hour or two drags an hour. I'm still going to be vaping a lot. And I found that when I, when I went down to two milligrams, I was, I was vaping a lot, not chain vaping, but vaping regularly. And I, I constantly felt this need that I needed more nick and I wanted to take more drags and so on. And I just fought it and fought it and fought it. And, you know, over the course of, seven to ten days it normalized out and then i started feeling normal again with with two milligrams and now i'm ready to go down to 1.5 or, or one milligram mm. and i like testing myself as well going without vaping for six seven eight hours <laughs> and you know just to just to reassure myself that i don't need this this thing that that much yeah anymore yeah no. I, mean, I was very 
The other day I went shopping. I was out for, you know, two hours or so shopping. I came home, put the stuff in the fridge, fed the animals, put the supper on and so on. And I realized after about 45 minutes, I haven't had a vape since I, since I got home, mm. which was fantastic because, mm. you know, as a smoker or when I started vaping, the first thing, you know, if I didn't take the vape out, with me. The first thing I did when I got home was, was have vape. Now I'm at the point where, you know, 45 minutes to an hour pass after I've got home. And if my mind's on other things, I haven't vaped. And that's, that's fantastic. Mm. Yeah, I can relate to that as well. Now, um, you know, uh, the biggest problem for me was uh, if I'm sitting in meetings at work and, you know, it's a two hour meeting and everybody is expected to to just listen and participate for two hours straight. And by an hour, you know, it literally feels like I, I can literally just pull the skin off my body. I, I just really need a cigarette. And, and, also, and my mood also changes, you know, dramatically. So, you know, um, I become irritable and, you know, it's difficult for me to, to focus and also participate in, in the way I w would want to. And I know that's all just because of, of, of uh, cigarettes. Now, I can't say nicotine on its own because I know that there's other stuff in cigarettes. And um, since I've started vaping, um, even, if I do, even if I do get a craving, it's not at the same level. You know, it's, it's definitely not at the same level um, as what I'm getting now. Um, and yeah, I, I would, I would watch a whole movie, um, you know, lying on the couch, um, because I'm so invested in the movie, I'd kind of forgotten that, you know, the vape was lying on the coffee table. Um, and that, that never happened while I was smoking, <laughs> you know, I would constantly be smoking and, and, and going on, um, you know, throughout a movie, uh, it's, you know, now it's, it's, it's not so bad anymore. But yeah, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for, for, for cutting down, Nick. I mean, I have a golden rule in my house that I only vape in my study. Mm. Now, the TV's in the lounge. So if I want to watch a movie, you know, I don't vape for two hours or, or whatever. I go through, sit on the couch, watch the TV. When the mm. movie's finished, then I come back through to the study and vape. And that again, it's, it's just good to apply that discipline where you're not absolutely having to vape every you know, of your life yeah you know, every five seconds you <laughs> needing needing to have a vape yeah it, it can become, become quite bad when vaping just came out um and people you know companies weren't aware so um you know the the company rules and regulations only spoke about smoking and you know they were bringing out these small little pen vapes and those were pretty stealth and guys were just sitting at the office i mean you know we work with um software and in a lot of developers and most of them smoke um and you know the more coffee and the more nicotine they can get in <laughs> you know at once um the better they produce code and you know so the guys started buying themselves these pen vapes and instead of going all the way down in the building and all the way outside to go and, and smoke. They were just sitting in the office and vaping and drinking their coffee. And, uh, you, you know, it got so bad that the company had to change their rules and include vaping in, in their rules and regulation of the building. Um, and of course the guys were asked to not vape there anymore, but, um, that happened, you know, anyway, um, Let's uh, let's move on to the next portion of the show, um, guys. If um, if you can please just comment on what you think the impact would be of um, passing this specific portion of the bull, or what your comments are around the bull, especially if you are a retailer um, or a wholesaler for that matter. Um, if you could let us know what your what your thoughts were. Um, about this bill and how to navigate it um, and how potentially it needs to be changed. <laughs> 